final stretch of the class. We've now finished the reader. Uh, we've covered a wide variety of theories. And just to sum up the old issue of what is a theory, what is a theory? Can someone give me uh, a layman's or laywoman's or layperson's definition of a theory? Yes. Right. It's a set of ideas that attempts to explain something or help us study something. What are theories based on? Experimentation or observation. Theories are founded on research. They're founded on empirical research, and I hear people talking. I hear people talking. Please. So, we now have all the theories, we've covered them all. Some of you have opted to switch to Hansen. This is okay because obviously we didn't have Hansen up until a week ago. So if you want to choose Hansen as your theoretical foundation, that's fine, especially if you're dealing with someone like Edward Snowden, who is an international leader, according to Hansen's definition of international leader. Okay? Again, every time you state something, that's not obvious, what do you do? When in your paper, when you claim something or say something's true, but that's not obvious, what do you do? You cite your sources. So you say, in my paper, I'm going to be dealing with leadership. And my concept of leadership is going to be taken from Hill. And then you give the page. Or my concept of leadership is taken from Zimbardo or whatever. There are many conflicting definitions of leader. The different theories in the book or in the reader contradict each other in the sense that they cancel each other out. You can't, you can't use all of them at the same time because they disagree, which is good. This also, I hope, makes the point that these are not to be confused with the Bible or the Quran. These are not the revealed truths of the divine being. These are people doing research, struggling with reality, and doing their best to define leadership according to their terms. Also to define ethics or morals according to their terms. So every time you make a choice, you have to say, okay, I'm coming down on the side of rest. If you come down on the side of rest, who do you disagree with? By de Kohlberg, by definition, because rest is neo Kohlbergian. So you would say, okay, I don't agree with Kohlberg because of this and this and this. I'm going to use rest because of this and this and this. So theory. So I think that's clear. Well, often when we say, theoretically speaking, we could assume blah, 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 blah. What is that day-to-day -day usage of the word theory actually mean? Get used to the concept of day to day Usage. What does that mean? Day to day. That's another way of saying day to day. Common. This is what people use. I mean, it's even okay in journalism. It's, not, it's even okay when you're just discussing something as a professor on TV. But when we're doing science, in all of your fields, we have this distinction. And I gave you the example at the very beginning of the semester, the word public. Not only is it, there's a day-to-day -day meaning and there's a scientific meaning, but the scientific meanings are different. In political science, public means of the government. But in business, what does public mean, a public company? By the shareholders as opposed to private, which is owned by a family or a group of friends or people who went into business. If you saw the movie uh, Jobs, you saw how then they decided to go public. Or uh, what was the other one about, uh, about uh, Facebook? What was it called? Social network. Social network. They decided to go public. So at first it's privately owned, then it goes public. So be aware of the fact that the terms not only have a day-to-day -day meaning, but they have, a conf they have conflicting meanings in different disciplines. Okay, I think we've established that. Now, 
we are working, you're now working on your papers. So just to review, why am I asking you to use a theory in your papers? Right, to take a real case from your major. What does liberal arts mean, by the way? We've had this before. It's, it means free. It's art in the sense of the term artisan, not in the sense of symphonies or Picasso or whatever. What does an artisan do? Works with his or her hands and makes things. So the arts is a general term for creating things. In universities, we create things based on scientific principles. All of us do, no matter what your major is. Excuse me, I didn't get your question in the back there. You had a question? No? OK. If you have a question, raise your hand. If you don't have a question and you want to talk, fortunately, this is going to have to go on the video. I will be forced to throw you out. OK, good. We'll be talking about this a little bit later on, the whole experience that we're having here with OER. Because parentheses, the OER committee at the university has now been set up. And this has been accepted as the mock-up for other courses to learn from. OK, so liberal arts means arts that are free of applied applications. For you who are engineers, you would say, what sense does that make? Well, what sense does it make to do theoretical math? To do abstract math that's not applied to real things. Does that make sense? No? Nobody just does math for math's sake? Of course. So here we have a non-applied science. If you study poetry, if you do it in a liberal arts sense, you study poetry, literature, music for its own sake. If it were a, what's the opposite of liberal arts? <laughs> Professional. The, the faculty of engineering, Mabruk for your ABET certification. Yes, you got it. I think. Didn't you? Yeah. Next year, but you're in the running now. Okay. So, the Faculty of Engineering is the best example of, an, of a professional school. When you study engineering, when you graduate, obviously, in most cases, you're not going to go be a journalist of engineering. You're going to become an engineer. The same thing would go for nursing or for pharmacy, this sort of thing. Liberal arts, on the other hand, is doing science for science's sake. This is why you guys who are in the professional field need to take a couple of liberal arts courses. This is what the GER is all about, the general education requirement. And one of the things that we teach that you might not learn in your professional field is the use of theory. So you all have a professional. <laughs> I hope that that's water. <laughs> OK. Uh, they were just toasting. I thought that was you know, a little bit unique for water. OK. Anyway. so. What we have here is a sort of tension, if you will. What does tension create, by the way, engineers? What, what does tension create? What does tension create? What can you what can you get what can you get what can you get out of str strain? Str what can you get out of of tension? Power, energy, right? If you, have, if you have some, for example, if you wind up some rubber bands until they're about to break, there's a lot of tension, right? What happens if you let go? It creates a lot of, we create tension. Tension is a good thing. It creates a positive energy. OK, so the tension here is between your practical experience in your major and the theories that we've learned about this semester. So that's the actual challenge now, is to go the step out of your comfort zone, if you will, and to apply theory to the real world. So we have the theories now. 
By the way, deontology is not a theory. For those of you who wrote that, deontology is an approach to theory. So what the theories are, Kohlberg, Hammerskjold, Rest, who else? Zimbardo, Hill, Hansen. We have six theories. So use one of those theories. So I'm, most of you have, done, have now done that. Almost all of you have chosen the real leader. Some of you uh, said, David works in a power plant. That's not a real leader. That's a theoretical, that's an abstract or hypothetical example. So all of you need a real leader, and all of you need, taken from the paradigms that we've had, a good, good dilemma. But I think that's clear by now. So some of you have been telling me that I'm causing a lot of pain in your life. And this is only a GER, so why do we have to write a 10-page paper? So, what I'm offering you now is the following. No. <laughs> page one is the title page. There you go, it's down to nine, right? Page two is the table of Contents. Okay, now we're down to eight, right? <laughs> yippee, yippee. Okay, good. Then we have pages three to eight, which is the actual paper. And no, that's not good. That's, that's too generous. Ah, it's too generous. Nine. And page. 10 is your sources. And for those of, I, I, almost, almost nobody used APA, almost nobody. So A, P, A. So we're talking here about a six page paper, right? That's not too much, that's almost half. So nobody complained. It's, it, what? Seven pages, I didn't trick you? <laughs> A page, just so you know. A page has 250 words or 1,800 characters. It's up to you, including empty spaces. I don't care. A page has 250 words or 1,800 characters. You can, the, the, the format is not important, but I will count how many words are on a page. 250 on a page. On a word, yeah, okay, you got it? Good. I want hard copy. I want the first draft on the 12th, which is the day of drop an ad. First draft. That's too quick? Okay. Guys, okay. That's, that's the last day before drop an ad. What I was going to say, if you, if, you, if you deliver the paper, on the 12th, that's a, that's a <laughs> right, of course. I will give you the grade for the paper, the full grade, assuming that the format is correct, okay? Is that clear? Is this a gift? Is this a gift, like, you know, late Christmas holiday gift? Okay. If you don't follow the format, I can't do this. So this is very important. On the formal level, if you deliver the paper, I will give you the full grade, and I will let you do the second draft for extra credit. Is that another gift? Yes, see how, the, see how, how all the gifts are bubbling up now? Guys, but, please, if the format is incorrect, I can't accept it as being submitted. So please, please pay attention. Title page, that includes your name, the name of the course, the name of the paper, blah, 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 it's obvious. Table of contents, I want you to divide it into subsections. Roman numeral one, Roman numeral two, Roman numeral three. So the different c categories in your paper, the introduction, the theory, the conclusion, the, the, the overall paper, that goes on the table of contents with page numbers. Is that clear? Then. 
The paper, three, yeah, seven pages, sorry about that. Uh, and the sources, APA. If you do all this formally correct, in a correct fashion, I'll give you the full grade for the paper. I'll give you, a, I'll give you a, notes if you have weaknesses, you write it again, and that will be extra credit. I told you at the beginning of the semester that those of you who want to get Fs are going to have a hard time. But I know some of you will not cave in to my pressure. And you'll insist on your right to an F. So anyway, is that clear now? The first draft, hand it in, you get the full grade if these criteria are respected. Then I'll correct it, and then for the final exam, you can hand it in again with improvements, and that will be extra credit on top of the full grade for the paper. Good, okay. So now I want to do some summing up of some of the applications that we can look at, or you can look at in the coming semesters if you're still staying at university, or if you are graduating this semester, mabruk, uh, that you can do in your career. So, we talked about several of them already, actual applications. Where's Greco? Here. Greco is our train man. So, one of the issues is train, train, somebody's actually suggested that as their paper, this is a good topic. The whole issue of the introduction of the railroads, or reintroduction, we should say, of the railroads. But the first one we already talked about is OER. Well, we'll be focusing now on why these are ethical issues. The third one is a project that we're doing with work. Look, you don't have to do any of this, but you have to write it down in your notes, okay? Which is the politics of extractive industry. Why politics of extractive industry? Before, before I go any further, what does extractive industry mean? What is, why do I just say mining? Why don't I just say mining? Why do I have to say extractive industry? Is oil, are oil and gas part of the mining industry? They are, but on a day-to-day -day level, most people, when they think of natural gas, they don't think of mining. So there's a new term that has been introduced, sort of to make everybody get it. Extractive industries includes metal mining, coal, and oil and gas, anything that you extract from the ground. Now, if we look at the extractive industries, normally the problems that are are surrounded, that surround this sector are not technical, because if you have natural gas or you have even some, something simple like coal, the large corporations will be there with their technology. It's also not a question of financing the mining, because if it's profitable, the large corporations will be there with their, techno with their money. The, normally the problem is political, and this is what we'll be looking at uh, from an ethical perspective. Okay, so open educational resources, the, industri the railroad industry, extractive industries, and the last one, because I'm a political scientist, I want to have something really political, is the centennial. What what, what happened, next year what will, what, will be, what will celebrate, commemorate the anniversary, the 100th anniversary of what in 1915? Does anyone know? 1915. That's 1914. The Armenian Genocide. The Armenian Genocide is important because as opposed to the other death, there was a lot of dying in World War I. Obviously, World War I led to the death of a lot of soldiers. Uh, the relationship between dead soldiers and dead civilians in World War I was better, if you will. There were, the ratio of soldiers to non-combatants was higher. There were more, it was a war between soldiers in World War I. In World War II, it was, to a large extent, also a war between soldiers and civilians who were unarmed. So World War I, if you will, was 
relatively humane, quote unquote, uh, compared to World War II. But one of the big exceptions was the intentional, to use a neutral term, extraction or removal of the Armenian population from what is today Turkey. And the big question is, was that an intentional genocide? Was it an attempt to massacre, to eliminate the entire Armenian population? Or were the Turks overwhelmed and they just happened to die on the road? Uh, I know anybody who's Armenian would have an answer to that question, but we're looking at this not because we want to take sides, but because we want to go through this scientifically. The science of removal of civilian populations. This is a field of study now, unfortunately, because it's become so common. Today, when you look at wars around the world, whether they're between countries or within countries, you see that one of the common phenomenon is that huge numbers of civilians are forced to flee. That's not only in Syria today, we're probably going to see something very similar very soon in Ukraine, where large parts of the civilian population are going to be forced out. And this is a trend that's increasing. So these are the, uh, the four topics. So let's look at them now one by one. Some of, somebody came up to me after class last week and said they're interested in the OER project. Who is that? Is, that, is, is he here today? Yeah, you're interested in that. You are interested as well. OK. This is, this is working on these projects is not going to influence your grade, but the description of these projects will be on the test. What? Yes. OK. What test? Well, we have a third test, don't we? Yeah. How can we have a third test? We don't have time? Ne yeah. No. We'll talk about that at the end of the class when we won't have the uh, camera on. OK. So the last test is going to be on the lecture, which is what we're doing right now. OK. So, so all you have to do now is take notes, right? OK. What is the ethical side of OER. We've been doing this all semester. We've been filming this class. Uh, what is an OER? Did anybody get curious and actually go online and look at an online course? Yes. What is the difference, first of all, what is the difference between OER and distance learning? What is distance learning? First of all, one of the things you should know, distance learning is not yet legal in Lebanon. That it's not yet legal. It has not been permitted by the ministry. Distance learning means that you take a course online, today traditionally. Historically, it was through the mail. You, took, you, got, your, you got your education or you took a course at a distance. So that your, your instructor was sending you assignments, you were doing the assignments, and sending them back by mail. Today, this is all online. It's not yet been permitted in Lebanon to do this. Some universities are starting to do it anyway. But distance learning means that you actually study through either mail or email or through a website. OER is something quite different. OER is what we call bricks and mortar education. Bricks and mortar means exactly what it means. This is mortar, this is bricks, or cement blocks. These are universities that actually have walls. They're not virtual, they're for real. But the courses that are offered are taped, and all the course material is uploaded. And people who, for whatever reason, are not studying, they're not taking this course this semester, or they might have been sick, or they're in a different faculty, or they're in a different country, they can go and look at this course online and take the course if they want. MIT, for example, has, put, has uploaded all of its courses. MIT, one of the most prestigious, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. A lot of country, uh, un, uh, universities like this have done this. What is the rationale behind this? Why, especially now in the US, are so many universities and other institutions of training and education offering their courses for free? Not the degree. That would be what? If they would offer the course if they would offer the degree online, what would that be? No, that would be distance learning. <laughs> they're, they're offering the courses for free. You can take the course. You can't get a 
degree, you can't get a certificate, but you can actually take the course. What would be a reason for doing this? To, to give people who can't afford higher education access to higher education. Point one. So it's a, it's a moral issue, if you will. It should be a way, it's a way of redistributing resources. If you have lots of money, no, but you can know it. Let's say, you're, let's say you have your, master's, your bachelor's degree in engineering from NDU, and you want to move on in your career, but you don't have act time or money to go to MIT or any other prestigious university around the world. You can log on to those courses, you can take them, you can learn the content, and you can integrate it into your work and your job. It's that time of the day again. Right. No. No. But you do have the knowledge. That's the point. Yeah, what, how can I prove to you that I do have knowledge? By showing me that you can do it. Let's say there's a certain field of engineering which is cutting edge, brand new. They weren't teaching it when you were studying at NDU. But it only came onto the market a year or two after you graduated. How are you going to learn this? by researching, or you can take an online course. You can have a prestigious professor at a top-notch university, quote unquote, teach it to you. Point one. Point two, and this is totally legitimate, professors can take those courses from MIT and give the course. They can use it as their course curriculum. Of course, they're expected then to what, do what? Cite the source. But if I, for example, if I found a ethics and leadership class at Oxford University and I looked at it and said, wow, there's some really cool stuff here I want to use, I could integrate part of that into my class at NDU, to my lecture, citing the sources, obviously. So the second thing is it's, one, giving people who don't have access to higher education access, which is a so social equality issue. Two, it's helping universities that are not top-notch to improve their teaching quality by basically applying the courses that are available at the best universities around the world. Third, so let's say social justice, big ethical issue. Second, development. And third, and this is a product of the Obama administration, and I must admit I have a certain weakness for the Obama administration. Uh, if I haven't mentioned this yet, I'm a party member of the Democratic Party, and I'm actually the chairman of the Democratic Party in Lebanon. We have out-of-country voting. If you're a U.S. citizen, you can vote this fall. Let's say, you're, let's say you're, you're 18 years old and you're a Lebanese with an American passport. This fall, you can vote in the American elections from Lebanon to the US, but you won't be able to vote in Lebanon this year. Out of country voting, in any case. Well, the Obama administration has put a lot of pressure on anybody who gets government money to make the results of that government money available to whoever, for who, available to those who paid for it. Who, if, you, if you have a corporation, a training institution, you're a university, a vocational school, and you get government funds, for research and development or for teaching, who's giving you that money? People. Ultimately, the people. So if the people, through their taxes, are giving money to the government and the government's giving it to you, then you have a responsibility to give it back to the people. Yeah, that's not something that Republicans agree with. But the de it's a Democratic, I mean, I know that I'm not going to be in trouble here because you're not going to all go quit Tayyar or uh, wait or whatever and join the Democratic Party because uh, you're not U.S. citizens. But anyway, so partisan politics is forbidden. But this is a form of redistribution. Tax dollars are paid by the people and the money should go back to the people through knowledge and skills. That's the first thing that OER does. Second, I just mentioned this. This is, a, this is really about what we're doing here. If, if this were going to actually go on the NDU website, what we're going to do is a mock-up now. We're going to integrate all of the materials you've been reading, getting the licenses and everything. 
What do we have to make sure happens? From an ethical perspective, also from a legal perspective. We have to deal, we have to deal with the issue of piracy. This is why OER is always closely linked to creative commons. And this is why I wore my CC button today. Uh, just because we're talking, you see it? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So, what does this mean? Copyright. So, there are two plays on that. The one is copy left, which means, you know, right is right wing corporate thinking, the other is left wing Marxist, socialist, whatever. Seems to be a little bit aggressive for some people's taste. So, the movement which is trying to make content available to the people, you just take, instead of one C, you take two C's, Creative Commons. Creative Commons is now become mainstream. It used to be sort of a radical fringe movement attacking corporations who were trying to have complete control of knowledge. Today it's been widely accepted and it's being supported by the US State Department, at least for the next two years. Where the, Barack Obama, where the Barack Obama is in the White House. We'll see what happens after that. But I think it's become so much part of the general scheme of things that it's going to stay. What is Creative Commons? It's the foundation of OER. Hope you're taking notes. Today I recommend everybody takes notes. Hint. So, today I recommend that everybody takes notes. Hint. I only say, I'm going to say it twice, okay? Good. So, what is Creative Commons? It's a foundation. <laughs> thank you for repeating. It's, okay, what is a commons? For those of you who are not native speakers or not really solid in your English, what is a commons? Does anyone know? A commons. Okay, in, it, commons, C-O-M-M-O-N-S, commons. In the Middle Ages, up until the early industrial period, and you had this in Lebanon too to an extent, small villages would have a plot of land which was owned by the entire village, where the villagers could, raise, could, could graze their sheep or their goats, or where they could plant things. The land belonged to the entire village, and thus it, belonged, it was common property. It belonged to everyone. It was called the village commons. This disappears with the Industrial Revolution where everything is privatized. Nothing is owned by the general population anymore. Uh, one of the many things that we lost in the so-called Dark Ages or the Middle Ages was this concept of the commons. What Creative Commons does is to take this idea that things belong to everyone and apply them to creative products. When you write a paper that's not plagiarized, <coughs> what does it have to have? What makes a paper not plagiarized? Cite sources. I mean, is this actually what we expect of you to do, is just to cite, if the paper is 100% quotes, what would that look like? No, it would be, cita it would be quotes, it would be cited. It wouldn't be plagiarism, but what's missing in that paper? You, you, right? You're missing. So anytime you take knowledge and cite the source, you're not committing a crime. You're not stealing it. But what you should not do is just take the whole paper and have a, you know, one quote after the other. This is why, you know you're not supposed to do this. This is why people tend to leave, leave, leave out the quotation marks sometimes uh, to make it not look like it's just a bunch of quotes. So, the creative side of things, the things that we create, whether it's software, whether it's an experiment that you did in, your, in the lab, in your major, whatever it did that's your unique contribution. Nobody has done this before. This is me. It doesn't have to be on the highest level. You're beginners. You're undergrads. So the creative achievements that you're responsible for are relatively low in the hierarchy of achievements in your field, but nonetheless you're starting to learn to be creative in that sense, in that narrow sense of you're adding your own thinking to the rest of the material that's out there. Now, normally 
the tendency is that once you've created something new, whether it's a, uh, a, a patented uh, pharmaceutical or whether it's a uh, new type of font and graphic design, you want to do what with it? You want to earn money, right? And so the patent, the copyright or the patent ensures what? You have the exclusive rights, and if somebody uses it, what do they have to do? They have to pay you, which is your right. There's nothing wrong with that. That's actually wonderful. So if you've created a lot of new value and information, this is called intellectual property. This is not tangible, concrete, material property. It's intellectual in the sense of its knowledge, creative pr production. You should get paid for it. How does the commons come in? Where does the commons, the idea of we're all in this together, fit in? But why should we share? Okay, what did I say about the, if you are not paying for the research, if you're doing the research at the university and the university is paying for the costs of the research, why should you get the money? This is, let's say, government funded, or it's funded by a donor, a sponsor. So when we're, when we're within the academic community, when universities are talking to each other, the Creative Commons idea is that we should all share. Yeah, it's a redistribution of knowledge. So anything that's been done in, at NDU that's really worth knowing, somebody can go in Yemen, or somebody can go in California, or wherever they are, and make use of it. People will say, yeah, that's, that's nice. I mean, we all share information, but what if they just put their name on it? What if they steal it? It's not patented. It's not copyrighted. What will stop them from stealing it? Ethics. Ethics. Or, no. without just looking at your fingernails? <laughs> A Creative Commons license. Creative Commons licenses mean that the data that we're putting up on an OER course can be used by anybody, but at the very least, they should cite the source. So what Creative Commons does, once you put a course up on online and somebody steals it, that means they use it without citing you, Creative Commons will go and sue them. And this is actually happening. And we have a lawyer, if you want to look him up, Pierre Khoury, he's our lawyer in Lebanon. So if you upload something on OER and someone steals it, Pierre will sue you. Yeah, <laughs> sue him, or if in case you do it. So we have a protection against theft. What if you say, well, that's nice, but what if the person takes my material and doesn't share it? What you can do is you can say, I don't want it only to be cited. First of all, normally it's free, but they have to cite the source. I can also put in the license that if you use something that I have created, you can use it for free, you cite me, but the thing you create with it also has to be under Creative Commons. No, let's give, for example, let's say I'm a musician and I write some very popular songs. But I'm, a, I'm making enough money and so I think I should share and give back to the people. So I put my new album, let's say half of it, I put under, put under Creative Commons. And half of it's not for free. And you're doing a video clip. And you need some music for your video clip. You take my music, it's for free. At the end, in the credits, you cite me. We're all, fi we're all fine, right? If I require you to also use Creative Commons, that means that your video clip has to be Creative Commons. What does that force you to do? Share. To share. You want to use my music for free? Now you have to share your video clip for free. So this creates a large community of like-minded people who share. So this is, this is, without this, OER doesn't work. Does everybody understand why? Is Creative Commons a, a a post-conventional or a conventional 
setup? It's post-conventional, why? The idea, remember I said that actually I'm a friend of piracy? Yeah, remember, what, what, what was the argument I used for piracy for music? You'd force musicians to go on tour. Now obviously, we can't actually do that. We can't, as professors, go and start stealing stuff in order to make our point. But we could, for example, lead. What's the best way to lead? By example. So I want people to share. What do I do? I share first. So if I can share and assume that my property is safe, then the next person will use it, and then they'll share too. So without creative, no, that's the post-conventional side of it. We want a large community of people who share and don't do things for profit, because only then can we learn from each other. What's the conventional side of this setup? Pierre Curie is the conventional side of the setup. He's the lawyer who's going to come and sue you and punish you. This is the conventional side. It's a link of post-conventional with conventional, because most people are not going to be post-conventional, as we know from Rest and from Kohlberg. So it's a, from a, if you use the Heinz dilemma, the highest level is we are doing this because we think that the world will be better if we all share at least some of our stuff. But knowing that most people are not going to follow that 100%, we build in a safety, safety mechanism, which is actually the lawsuits for people who don't respect Creative Commons licenses. So OER. Now this is up and running. We've, we've got um, a committee set up at the university. If you look at your NDU email, you'll see which, who's on that committee. Uh, but I'll also put it on our, our blackboard. So if you're interested in working on this in the future, uh, we are looking for some students who want to be part of the project. So that's the first one. Second one, trains. Rail, road is often abbreviated RR. So what is the ethical side of railroads? What, what, what about the railroad system could be seen as in the concept of good and bad? Not just functional. Not just it works or doesn't work, but it's actually a good thing in an ethical sense or a bad thing. What is the major distinction between railroads and trucks? OK, one is public transportation. They can be private as well. But what do railroads not do that trucks do? If you're going from Beirut to the Baka, you have a bunch. Like yesterday, I was going to uh, Kahale. The, the truck fell over, smashed a, a car. I think the person died. And the whole road was blocked. With the railroads, do the railroads go on the same road as we do? No. So, removing freight from the roads does what? It's a safety issue. Immediate safety improvement, which is still a technical issue. What does it also do? That's still the okay, safety, traffic, congestion. It's also an ecological issue. If you look at the, I'm not sure of the, of the statistics, but once a train from People, those of you who know something about physics, you know what inertia is, right? Once a train gets up to full speed, we all know how hard it is to get, to get it to stop again. <laughs> what, does, what, what does that mean from an economic perspective or an environmental perspective? Once you got the train rolling, which takes some energy, it just keeps on rolling on its own almost. You just need a little bit of extra energy to keep it up to speed. That's not the same thing with trucks. So here we have already, this is an ecological issue, uh, an ethical issue. Ecology, why is ecology not just scientific in the sense of technical, economic? Why is it also moral? Why do, why do, what, what does, what's the morality or the ethics of ecology? That could still just be technical. Okay. 
why is not polluting being ecological also an ethical issue? Good. It's about caring about others. Ultimately, ecology goes beyond enlightened self-interest. What does that mean? Let's take rest. You have three options with rest. Self-interest, maintaining norms, post-conventional. If I'm ecological, I mean, I have to admit, when I buy vegetables for my daughter, I buy buy, uh, organic. Am I being ethical? Why would you not buy normal cucumbers and tomatoes for your small children? You don't want to kill them, right? I mean, we uh, took a long time to get these kids and we don't want to poison them in their early stages of growth, right? We all know about the scandals with high water content vegetables. So, you buy organic for your children out of self-interest. It's enlightened self-interest, but it's still selfish. It's self-interest in the restian sense. Post-conventional would be caring about the world. So if we look at now the overall effect of climate change, we move then from the conventional to the post-conventional. Or or that's in Kohlbergian sense. Or in a restian sense, we move from enlightened self-interest to post-conventional. So railroads, one of the ethical issues, is ecology. But railroads are really, really interesting as far as good governance is concerned. If you look at Centennial, oh, there's two ends in there. Wait a sec. Uh, if you look at technologies, some technologies, once you set them up, they, they run by themselves. Has anybody been on a train? What? Did you, what, if you look out the window when a train goes through the station, even when it doesn't stop, what do you see along the track? You see passengers, maybe, but you see the railroad employees standing there going Every time a train goes through a station, even though it's a small station, the, the people who work at the railroad staff have to check the trains, because the trains can have problems, and if they do, and the train has a wreck, it's a massive problem. So good governance, in this sense, is follow-up or maintenance. Maintenance, is this something that Lebanon is good at? Not at the moment. We can discuss why that's the case, but Maintenance is a skill that you learn through practice. If you have a railroad, believe me, you have maintenance. The Egyptians are not very good at the maintenance of their railroads, and they have almost every year massive fires and wrecks and everything. The Egyptians' railroads are very dangerous because they have poor maintenance. But even poor maintenance is maintenance. So this will have a feedback effect on everything else. Railroads or sort of a training ground for good governance in general. If, you can, if, a, if a country has a good railroad, normally they have a good government. Because it takes a lot of day-to-day work to be very exact. You can't cheat and cut corners with railroads. So ecology, good governance. For Lebanon, what's the, le- the, the big issue with the railroads? Greco's been studying the railroads. Where is Greco? Yeah. What's the big problem with the railroads in Lebanon? If we want to start the trains running again, what's the big issue? The right of way. What is, who owns the right of way? The government. People have built illegally on the right of way. So from, from Biblos up to Batrun and almost the whole way to Tripoli, the, track's still, the track is still free. But between Biblos and Junia, it's been built on a lot, and from Junia into Beirut, it's gone, right? So, 
if you're going to reopen the railroads, what's the first thing you're going to have to, you're going to, have to do? <laughs> we could remove all the buildings or we could do something else. <laughs> what, a, we, what, what, what would you do with the people who have, what, 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 what is it called when you steal government property? It's a, it's a felony, right? It's one of the major crimes that you can commit. Now, there are various options. One of the options would be to say, this is a crime, but we're going to have an amnesty for all those felons who've built on the track. And we're not even going to make them pay rent for the last 30 years, but we're going to give them a, an amnesty on that. But let's say 50% or 30% of the rent over the last 30 years, they have to cough it up. They have to pay it. What can you do with that money? You can build an elevated train or whatever. The whole discussion on the reconstruction of, this, of the Lebanese railroad system is going to force Lebanon to deal with a long, long legacy of impunity. Now, if you can deal with the impunity with the railroads, what could you probably do? Deal with the impunity in other areas. So these are three important areas for the railroads. So, for those of you who are interested in railroads because they're just technically cool, that's also nice. I mean, anybody who studies the railroads is fascinated by the technology. It's just, you can't, even for people like political scientists like me, when you see, tr when you see trains, you just go, wow. It's, it's a really cool technology, and it's relatively simple. So, these are some of the areas for railroads. Good. I hope you're all writing this down. Yeah. Good for you. Okay. The politics of extractive industry. When I started working in Lebanon, I benefited from the fact that as, as I was, whenever I take a, um, a fill out an application for a, uh, a conference coming from Austria, you had to pay the full price. And they always had this category, developing world. And so when I moved to Lebanon, I said, oh great, now I'm coming from, from the developing world, I can go half price to the conference. But they ex accept Arab countries. <laughs> and then they had, an, uh, 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 even an, uh, below that they had, accept the non-oil producing Arab countries. So if you came from a non-oil producing Arab country, you went half price. You're lucky. Unfortunately, Lebanon, you're out of luck. In the future, we will be an oil and gas producing country and we'll have to pay full price just like the Kuwaitis. I think we can live with that. I think we can live with that, being in the same boat with the Kuwaitis. I think that it's a pain that we can live with. Now, what we see with oil and gas industry, does anybody know what Dutch disease is? Huh? What is it? The economy, it's all co correct what you said for the rest of you, for, since you didn't hear that. The economy is so dependent on one or more, nat no, more natural resources that all the investment, all the government infrastructure goes for that sector to the detriment, to the disadvantage of the other sectors. So for example, if you have a thriving uh, vehicle industry, your country's producing tractors and trucks and cars and bicycles, and all of a sudden you have gas, why do we need to produce vehicles anymore? We can just make money off of gas. But maybe a country should have a broader based economy, differentiated. It's like a, it's, in farming we call it monoculture. If a country only produces one or two crops, let's say tobacco and sugar, that's probably the worst thing you can do, like Cuba. <laughs> Cuba was producing tobacco and sugar for the global market. They're totally dependent on the global market. They don't produce other things. So you have to diversify. This is what's happening in the Gulf now. The Gulf is, the Gulf, most Gulf countries have realized that sooner or later, this is going to run out. 
So what are they doing? Moving into other sectors. And some of them are doing it relatively successfully. So the tendency will be for Lebanon that once the, go the oil and gas starts, that the, 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 the manufacturing industry, which is already suffering, is going to suffer even more. Agriculture, which is already suffering, is going to suffer even more because all the resources are going to go into this sector. The second one is what we call the resource curse, which is Dutch disease, any country can suffer from that, as the name Dutch says. I mean, if there's any country that's known for its rule of law and its high level of development, it's the Netherlands. But it's the Dutch who actually gave the, the, the Dutch to Dutch disease. So, by the way, Norway made, made a very smart decision. We talked about this at the beginning of the semester. Norway has taken most of its natural gas income and put it in a sovereign wealth fund, which is now, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, $100 billion. It's one of the largest sov sovereign wealth funds in the world, as big or bigger than some of the Gulf states. Why did they do that? To avoid Dutch disease, if, if that money is not going into the Norwegian economy, they have to keep on producing tractors and bicycles and, and building houses and, and, and advancing in their agriculture. They can't just live off of the oil and gas. So they've avoided Dutch disease. So will Lebanon avoid Dutch disease? We'll see. Okay. The resource curse is a, is a uh, phenomenon in countries that traditionally have protracted conflicts. Protracted means over time, ongoing conflicts. If you have problems between different racial groups, skin color, if you have problems between different language groups, as we see in Ukraine now, between the Russian speaking and the Ukrainian speaking, if you have problems between different skin colors, blacks and whites, like it was in South Africa, these conflicts go on over time. Or confessional, as we see in Lebanon or Bosnia, whatever. These conflicts become worse when the country has a lot of money. Why? Because now you have the resources to pay for all those weapons, and it doesn't run out. One of the major problems in West Africa, one of the curses is the diamonds. They call them blood diamonds. Diamonds are probably the worst thing you can have if you have a conflict in your country. Whereas natural gas, Takes a long, takes a long time to build pipelines. And once you've built them, you have to use them for a couple of decades in order to make a profit. Diamonds, on the other hand, put them in a bag and off you go. Sell them. So diamonds are countries with diamonds with these kind of conflicts, typical of the resource curse. Other precious metals, gold, silver, platinum. Very typical in Africa. So, second issue. To avoid the Dutch disease, it's to an extent a an issue related to railroads. It's a maintenance planning issue. The resource curse is highly ethical. Final one. So if you're interested in any of these, are, these are ongoing projects. The centennial of the genocide. 2015. I'm not going to go into detail, but for those of you who are interested, uh, there are many projects, of course, going on. We have one at NDU related to, we talked about this before, Musa Dach. Dach. In Armenian, Musaler, which means mountain in Armenian. Uh, in Arabic, Jabal Musa, it's on the border between Turkey and Syria, near the town of the city of Antioch. Antioch is a very famous ancient Christian city. It's in the Bible many, many times. So, this mountain was the scene of a successful Armenian resistance against the genocide where actually the Armenians defeated the Ottomans. And there's a famous book, The Forty Days of Muzadek. And the reason that I'm so, I'm not Armenian by the way, in case my name, I didn't my, change my name from Debusian to Debus. No. <laughs> we wanted to fit in so we stopped calling ourselves Debusian and just called, no, that's not true. Okay. Uh, for those of you who are Armenian, I hope you excuse the joke. Okay, uh, who wrote this novel? Yeah. 
Franz Werfel, and where's Franz Werfel from? Guess. Austria. Don't say Germany. Don't say Germany, or also. <laughs> when Lebanese call me German, I call them. Ah. <laughs> There you go, okay. <laughs> Same thing with the Canadians and the Americans, or the Australians and the New Zealanders, right, okay. So, the 40 Days of Musadek was written by Franz Werfel, and what we're doing is we're, we're, tr we're trying to turn this mountain by 2019, and here's where the engineers again will get something out of this, and the science students, a GIS based museum. Cool, cool, virtual museum, okay? So, the whole purpose, what, is, what does this have to do with ethics? This is probably the most clearly ethical issue. I'm tearing down a mountain? You don't know what GIS is? You do. <laughs> so wh why would the GIS-based museum in any way at all impact the mountain? The GIS doesn't affect anything. It's a virtual museum. It's in, it's in cyberspace. So it doesn't hurt the mountain. The mountain, nobody knows it's there. <laughs> anyway, let's not get into the side of GIS. What is the purpose of this? This is really the most ethical of all the topics. What happened in 1915? The, the, over a million Armenians were forced to leave their homes and walk on foot from Western and Central or, uh, Turkey, what is now Western and Central Turkey, to the Syrian desert. On the way, a lot of them died. Those that survived, many of them were killed in the deserts of Syria, leading to an extermination rate or a death toll of 80, 90, 80 to 90%. That in itself is not a genocide. It's a genocide genocide, side mean kill, gen kill of people. A genocide is an intentional killing of an entire people. The Turks would say, we didn't know it was going to happen, we're sorry. We, you know, we didn't really you know, want them to die, they just sort of died. I don't know, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> That's the Turkish excuse, right? So the important, of course Armenians get very upset about this, and it's obvious you can't have a dialogue between two people or two parties when the one side doesn't admit that it happened, right? The important point here is to have a differentiated approach. What we're trying to do is to look at this entire issue in a very scientific, historical way to train people to counter the Turkish arguments, not through emotions, but through science. Because through science, you do something that Martin Luther King suggested that we do, and this is how we get back to ethics. When we have direct action, according to Martin Luther King, what are the four steps? It was on the test. How is he now integrating Martin Luther King again into this? First step, research. Second step, guys, second step, negotiations. Third step, Self-purification, fourth step, direct action. Then you can go out and burn tires, right? Uh, but only as the fourth step. But what's the first step? Is research. So what we're doing now, this whole project is about researching the details of the genocide so that you can then confront the other side, which is the Turkish government, the Turkish media, with the facts, which you've now researched. And they're probably going to still say, what? Doesn't, we don't care. You know. Before you go out and burn tires, what do you have to do? Get tires to burn. <laughs> Get tires to burn. <laughs> Self-purification. And finally, OK, good. Now we've got it. OK, all of them. Good. OK. So final point, I, I handed out something with the movie. I handed out something with the movie on, on Thursday. There's a couple of them left here on the chair, in case you weren't here. So if you want to go up and get one, there's two or three left. What did the movie Thumb prints? In case you didn't see it, I put the link on Facebook. What, does the what is the point that Thumb prints makes? 
No. What's the point that thumbprints makes? This is like, do you have the red bag, Mariam? Mariam, do you have the red bag? The red cloth bag, or where did that get to? Can you bring it to me? What is the point that Thumbprints makes? The movie. Not that being ethical is costly. What? Being ethical at the first stage is costly. They they not costly. More important than that. If you want to be an ethical company and be a profitable ethical company and actually make profits out of your ethics, you have to be. 100% ethical. And he goes through the owner of, uh, yes? Right. So if you're not 100% ethical, that means that you're 5% unethical, which means that if authorities or your business partners or your suppliers, your customers, whoever, see you being 5% unethical, one, your 95% is not believable, it's not critical, credible, and if you go and complain about them being unethical, what can they do? They can say you're unethical too. So it's either 100% or nothing. That's the position made by the movie. The second thing is you need skills. The third thing is you need, this is something that personal, that's an O, change. So, of course the big question is here, is that possible to be 100% ethical? What, you need skills to be ethical? And finally, you need personal change. So Maria, could you come up, please? In the last five minutes. Greco, can you come and help me, too? Yeah? No, I, I know the people are not going to like you after this, but uh, I'm going to hand these out, and you're going to answer the following question. And then you can leave. Why don't you do the other side? OK, answer the following question. No, individually. Indi no, don't do it. <laughs> it's open notes. It's open notes. I don't know how many times I said take notes today. It's open notes. Okay, please. Take one of the four topics we just discussed, one of the four, and tell me from an, for those of you who want to do the test, uh, I hope you can hear me. Tell me, in one of those four areas, in your opinion, can you be 100% ethical? Yes or no? What are the skills required to be ethical in that one of the four areas we talked about today? I, okay, uh, excuse me. For those of you who want to leave, guys, guys, for those of you who want to leave, keep talking and then you can leave, okay? Take one of the four topics we just discussed in class, right? Then answer the question. In one of those four topics, I'm not going to say what they are because you wrote them down. I'm not going to say. Can you be 100% ethical in one of those four areas? Is it possible? The answer can be no. But why is it no? Two, if you're going to be ethical, 100%, 95%, whatever you decide, do you need any special skills? And three, is personal change necessary? When you're done, you can leave. Thank you. The class is over. <laughs>